Hello, how is it going? It is Fako coming at you with another Legends of Rune Terror deck guide. And I've got the last but not least in terms of the decks I've been sharing recently. Ashta Jawani is going to be last up. In terms of all the mana decks I've shared with you guys, decks that I recommend you can climb with, this is gonna be the last one. The big the big game changer, the big meta decider, Ashta Jawani, you can't go wrong really playing this deck. The pacing is really good. I can highly recommend it for climbing, jumping in games, playing them in a reasonable amount of time, like yeah, I think this deck's extremely good, and there's a few different variants. I think this is the variant that you want to guys, uh, you guys want to be going for. And it's going to be the variant that uses Captain Farron. I think having a single copy, some decks are running two of Captain Farron. You're fine with one. Uh, this is the way to go, especially for laddering, knowing that you have a alternate win condition sitting in your deck somewhere for a deck that can already curve out pretty well and protect the board and fight extremely well for the board. Captain Farron gives you a great alternate win condition. This is also going to be the version that is using Averrosian Hearthguard over Kato. I think for terms of simplicity and picking up the deck and learning how to play it, I think the version with Hearthguard makes it a lot more simple. You just play your dudes on curve, you play the 5-5 that buffs the rest of your deck and you keep playing your guys. You can definitely consider playing the version that uses Kato the Arm. I think if you're doing that, you probably want to be cutting Captain Farron as well. But for any beginner friendly uh, player, this deck is extremely good. Um, you can definitely win some games with it and climb ladder. So three copies of Sejuani, one copy of Reckoning, uh, two times harsh wins. You don't want to be using any more harsh wins than this. Harsh wins does the job it needs to when you find at least one copy of it. As I said, three hearth guards. Uh, three Assessors, so this card is going to give you some pretty insane card draw. The ability to combo this with um, Averosian Trapper is absolutely insane, as well as Traforian Glory Seeker if you ever curve out. This deck struggles in the card draw department, so if you ever get like two or three draws off of this, you're almost winning the game. This deck's extremely oppressive when that happens, and the fact that you can draw any cards at all, it's just a backbreaker for any matchup. So being able to set up a good Assessor is quite important for this deck in terms of winning a game. This is going to be a version that uses two copies of Babbling Bjerg. I think it's a great fit, especially when you're running the version that uses Hearthguard and you're buffing the rest of your deck. It gives you more targets for Bjerg since some of your units have like uh, four attack and three, sometimes you can get double buffs. Uh, one times Flash Freeze. Now uh, we're running one Flash Freeze. Not every deck is running one Flash Freeze. Uh, Hung Twister. I think one Flash Freeze is a great. It gives you another alternate kind of uh, win condition similar to Captain Farron. Sometimes this can really backbreak anything because it can frostbite anything. And doesn't matter how big the unit is, you're going to clap it. Uh, three times Coin Strike right now is hitting lots of great targets and also goes along really well with the burst speed frostbite cards, which grants a uh, zero power to your opponent's units, by the way. So Calling Strike is extremely insane outside of the fact that it goes along really well with uh, Frostbite. You're hitting a lot of great targets. Twisted Fate, uh, Swain and uh, Ezreal are the first ones to come to mind, which are pretty popular in the metagame. Uh, three times Trifori, uh, Avarys and Trapper, sorry, this card is extremely strong. This is one of the go-to cards to look for in your mulligan. Uh, this is, is this is just insane. If you manage to draw your, if you manage to get your Trapper, you're boosting your win rate dramatically. Uh, three times Trifori and Glory Seeker. Uh, three times Ice Veil Archer, more Frostbite Synergy, trades into some good three drops. Uh, two times Averroes in Trapper instead of three. I think in a lot of matchups, um, just having the ability to find one in the early game is going to be enough. And hopefully you can lean on your Assessor for your card draw. Some lists will run three. I think it's kind of like the weakest card in this deck. So I think trimming it down to two is reasonable. And if you draw one in the early game, you're balling. If you draw more than one, it's kind of slow. Three times Omen Hawk is definitely a, a very good keep in this deck. <laughs> this is, it's, Omen Hawk is just an insane card. I don't think it's much to talk about it when I'm summoned Grand Two Allies in, in your deck, on top of your deck specifically. Plus one, plus one. Uh, two Elixir of Iron and two Brittle Steel. Some uh, Ash Sedge decks are using more Frostbite. I think the Frostbites can be kind of slow, and in the end, you do want to play your units on curve more than anything. And just having every now and then the ability to Brittle Steel something or Elixir of Iron to buff your unit is good enough. Um, I think three Brittle Steel and three Elixir of Iron is just too much and it gives you some clunky draws here and there. That wraps up the list. Shall we jump across and talk about the Mulligan? So in terms of the Mulligan, this is probably like one of the most simplest ways to look at it. Literally look for the curve. You're kind of tr trimming down your deck looking for Omen Hawk. Uh, Sentry is not oftentimes a super good keep or nor is Ice Veil Archer. But if you have a curve, you can consider keeping these. The most important card to look for is actually Averosian Trapper. Do not ever kick this card. I can't think of a reason why you'd ever consider it. Even against aggro decks, if you have no one or two drop, you're going to play this on turn three and you'll hopefully draw into your Yeti. Definitely looking definitely looking for a curve though against aggro is quite important. 
But outside of that, honestly, in most matchups, it's just going to be looking for the Trapper and looking for the Omen Hawk. So looking for those in the opening hand is going to be huge. Against aggro decks, you'll probably consider keeping like the Biddle Steals and the Elixirs of Iron. And against Control, you'll probably be kicking these most of the time. A uh, Trifurian Glory Seeker is going to be good in uh, almost any matchup, except for decks that have the ability to ping it off. So mostly like Twisted Fate Ezreal, like Karma Ezreal, and like Shadow Wilds decks. But it's going to be really powerful in the mirror matchup as well. Um, you can also keep it against any mid-range deck outside of um, obviously Ashen, etc. Still, you could have reasons for keeping it. Um, if you see a curve, I don't think it's too much of a harm to keep it, but it it, it can get definitely get picked off a lot easier. Uh, Babbling Bjerg, anything above here is probably too expensive to keep. I've kept a Cecil before with a curve that it would be to keep Avrosian Trapper, like Glory Seeker and Omen Hawks and stuff like that going into a Cecil. That could be pretty oppressive, so it's definitely a worthwhile keep. But if it's a kind of clunky hand, don't keep a Cecil. You'll draw into one if you need it. Um, outside of that, these cards up here, anything from 5 mana or above, do not keep in almost any matchup. It's important that we play on curve. Any mid-range deck wants to play the best on curve. You can keep some combat tricks in the matchups that you feel like the most powerful. Like going up against um, Twisted Fate Ezreal, Culling Strike finds a lot of value in that matchup. Especially because they will probably be playing Ezreal on curve sometimes, or kind of like for more tempo. So Culling Strike is going to help you a lot against that. I don't think there's any reason to keep Flash Freeze either. This is too much of a unique uh, certain card that you'd probably rather draw it later into the game. And that hopefully wraps up the Mulligan Guide. In terms of the general strategy, it's all about kind of playing your beefy minions, taking extremely favorable trades, curving and going into Ash, getting more Frostbite cards, and just really being oppressive. Setting up a Cecil 2 can be a great strategy for this deck. But outside of that, pretty much play your dudes on curve, take the right trades, um, set up for a big swing, and yeah, you just go from there. Just keep swinging your asshole at them and you'll be fine. We are up against a Swain Twist of Fate. This is going to play out very similar to Yusuke Control where they're pretty strong against mid-range decks. Fortunately enough, we have a pretty good opening hand. Everything gets kicked. I don't think Brita still does very much. I'm also going to kick that. I think finding just a decent curve is going to be what gives us the best chance here. Yeah, double Omen Hawks. Yeah, I think kicking the Brita still makes a lot more sense. Like finding Avrosian Trapper is like very key. Those five fives are gonna be extremely oppressive. Um Is it worth using a Brita still in this situation? I think I'll just pass here. That's very cute, but not very good in this matchup. I'm just gonna block like this. It's probably the one card we don't want to see. It's very susceptible to tons of removal. Fortunately, we still have to play it. It just, it, we just still have to play it. There's like a lot of reasons to play it, especially like drawing um, for an assessor and also playing Ash. I could almost go for the Reckoning. It probably gets countered a lot of the time. I think just playing Ash is fine. Because we also have Brittle still. I mean, you could play um, Twist of Fate here. It starts to open up more reasons for Reckoning. I don't think it's worth trading here. Perhaps now we'll do it. I'll keep his board reasonably in check. And with the rest of the resources that we have in hand, it's like almost mandatory that we try and make some plays. Keep up, keep up. It is like extremely hard for him to clear this, right? I guess gotta go for it. We're in a pretty awkward spot. I'm pretty sure it's hard for him to deal with this. Like, we'll pretty much lose the game if this doesn't go through, but we could also, like, it just sets us up to, like, win very hard. So it's a bit of a coin flip here. I was, I was convinced it was hard for him to deal with that. I can either go wide. I don't mind it, actually. I think going wide is a little bit better than playing Avarosian Sentry right now. Like, this is essentially, like, a lot more stats with the ability to, like, play two units. 
I like Sentry here strictly because I can follow up with um Ice Veil Archer. It doesn't deal with the um, Glory Seeker. I get to trade off something. However, this is kind of spooky. Should I be developing the Ice Veil Archer? It just plays into his ability to develop more. I don't like it too much. It, I'm probably losing my board here. Like this could be like a death's hand, I would assume. Yeah. In that case, I wonder if it's worth to just um, consider developing the Ice Veil Archer. This would be to help play around certain cards. Like, like we, we choose to ignore certain cards. Right now, I think holding back Ice Veil Archer is a lot more important than playing it. He still play um Swain, but he won't have uh, the ability to clear my board. So I like Ice Veil Archer here into Hearthguard. This is a matchup where hitting out Everosian Trappers is like kind of relevant. Stay back. My life for Everosa. <sighs> now the next question is like, do I think I should be protecting my units or just like letting them trade down? Everosian Sentry gives me more card draw, but I don't think I want to be drawing my cards right away. We'll just see how he reacts here. I, I'm, I'm somewhat convinced I'm supposed to protect my board. So perhaps this is just fine. I think I'd rather draw the cards after I've played Hearth God. This might look kind of strange, but with the amount of like resources we have in hand, I've got to protect my board. It's already pretty susceptible to Twisted Fate. And I think um, if you would play Twisted Fate after I play Hearthguard, setting up a Ravenous Flock, I think I'll probably just lose. It's not unreasonable for him to have a play like that. As I've said though, like I don't think this is a very favorable matchup. There's a lot of reasons to actually consider playing Assessor here. If he plays Leviathan, like I think I'm just losing, so... I don't know, I don't really have an ability to clear the Swain, so just playing an Assessor is reasonable. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like, it's Leviathan or Bus. Um, that's kind of surprising. So he's just going to block with the Yeti Yearling. I think there might be reasons for actually letting him trade like that, because I, I don't know if he wants the Yeti too much. He didn't have Leviathan, so this puts him further away from it. I could also consider using the Elixir of Iron, if I want to be extremely cheesy. He's already got a way to guarantee that he kind of, uh, Blunders me next turn in case he's running that kind of package. Okay. I think if his next card would be a bad draw and following into a Yeti, that might give me a chance. If he draws straight into the Yeti, that might be a little bit of a problem. As for developing a Ice Fat Archer, I don't think I like it too much. I mean, like, because if he plays Leviathan next turn, I can strictly use it against that. If he draws it, pretty much. Hmm. Colony Strike's actually pretty nuts. What with the Salvage? Does it does it burn the cards on the top? I could negate his plunder here in case he's running Riptide Rex. Yeah, I think I would definitely like to counter his Riptide Rex. I'm convinced he's probably playing. Uh, no, they don't usually play that. This is fine. He can replay another Swain, which is probably in hand. Regardless. What's kind of hilarious, I haven't touched his Nexus once. Reasonable play. Finally enough, I can Elixir of Iron here. I think it's worth it. Especially if I draw into another Assessor. The 
could be really good for us. And he'll probably play Swain. This is kind of interesting. What's happening here? Okay. That seems extremely expensive. So because we frostbited the Swain as well, the guarantee is clearing it. Um, he could have like easily used some resources in hand. Okay, that's a really good draw for us. I'm going to grant vulnerable to Sejuani. With Sejuani to the Zap Spray Fin, I apologize. And if we can get card draw right about now, that is going to be a game changer. We've only got a certain amount of time. We're pretty fortunate that he hasn't drawn. And that's a pretty bad draw in a sense. We're fortunate enough that he hasn't drawn into his uh, Leviathan. That's pretty much going to be at what point we lose. Captain Farron is a fantastic draw. This gives us some uh, some new outs. Hmm. Maybe I'm playing too passive. See, that's a problem. But, funnily enough, I can clear it. So that is huge for us. But then I wonder what's more important, clearing the Leviathan or clearing the Swain? I'm convinced that there has to be the, um, we have to clear the Leviathan. This is strange. It's going to lead with the Omen Hawk first of all. These are crazy draws right about now. I have 11 mana, I can still play all these cards. Only the finest serve. Yeah, clearing the Leviathan is for sure the higher threat. It is the most highest threat. Captain Farron is going to be massive. So this single copy of Captain Farron strictly gives us an alternate win condition now. He probably goes for a stun here, without a doubt. This is to stun the Captain Farron, reasonable enough. I think I can afford to just kind of swing with Sejuani as well. Most likely he would want to block with um, Swain. I'm kind of playing into a few cards here and even swinging with this is fine. I can swing with everything here in fact. I'm going to lose to his last card which could be Leviathan but outside of that this is quite threatening. The Elixir of Iron can play some tricks on my on his like blocks. We'll see exactly how he blocks here. Another card that's kind of spooky is uh, Noxian Guillotine. I can either play around Noxian Guillotine or play around we still have heaps of gas, so I think I'll just let this go through as it is. Yeah, like Noxian Guillotine does a lot of work, but I'm not too concerned. What's the most spooky is the Leviathan in hand. <laughs> okay. If I stay wide enough on the board, um, Leviathan isn't too spooky. Okay, he's, he's drawing. He's got a fair bit of gas. There goes Flock and Petty Officer. Chances are higher for Leviathan and good cards. Ravenous Flock comes down, no problem. I can actually save it, I will choose to do that. After the back of the okay, that's fair enough. Let's start to dump these trappers on the field. Let me think if I should be, I should be considering like, if I want to start flexing in some decimates, I think that could be a good play. So I'm going to choose to do that. 
Um, I see oftentimes a mistake where players like manage to get to the Captain Farron and don't utilize his decimates enough because they're almost like lethal damage themselves. And then all I have to do is like connect one point of damage afterwards. Like one face, uh, one connect one attack. So I think the best line I can consider right now would be to, yeah, probably play one decimate and one more unit and then next turn open attack and then play the other decimates and then we should win. Um, we kind of turned that around. He was, he didn't draw Leviathan when he needed it. So I think we got kind of lucky there. So I guess we'll play another game that's probably a bit more realistic. Like it's not uncommon for them to have Leviathan on turn eight. So that was just extremely unlucky. Uh, this is not something I'm looking forward to. One of my pet peeves is mirror matchups. Some mirror matchups are funner than others. This one, however, doesn't feel as fun. This is pretty crazy. I think I would consider keeping this. I am. Um, we can we can consider kicking kicking the uh, Ice Veil Archer, but I do like the curve. And Avaro's can trap is massive in the matchup. Glory Seeker's not too bad either. But it can get countered. But because we have the Assessor too, it's pretty nutty. This is decent. This is like a good hand for a mirror matchup. <clears throat> And he hasn't ever got the one drop either, so he's probably kept a similar kind of hand. We'll just play the uh, sentry here. There. We need to like kind of develop in a certain way that allows us to get an assessor off for at least like two or three cards on draw. And this is kind of to play around like if his card in hand is Glory Seeker. That's actually pretty wild. I think um, what I should do here is open attack for sure. Because this is two guaranteed damage that if I develop, I probably don't get that damage. So. We should take this two damage for sure. He's got the trapper, I've got the trapper. We're, we're, we're vibing. So now it comes down to who's gonna draw the Yeti. Okay, I didn't get mine. He kind of got his. So what I can do here is I can play Icefell Archer into a Glory Seeker. This is to get some card draw. I could also top deck Yeti. I will lean towards this play. Protecting the board is going to be key here. I probably do not block here. If I feel like it, I can consider playing blocking with the Ice Veil Archer. What's going to be huge here is if we get the Yeti, I think we're just in a great spot. Wow, we're in a really good spot. Most of the time this gives us two card draws. Uh, Brittle Steel is massive as well. It allows us to kind of do this. Wow. So he's kind of forced into harsh winds here. I'll first do this. He's going to react. I oh, will definitely brittle steal the Avarosian Trapper if need be. Hmm. I do think I want to save my Trapper. So we'll do this. Wow, I am I'm not sure if we're winning, but we're in an extremely good spot. It could swing at any point though. Bow to no one. I don't even think I played my Sejuani just yet. I can actually just frostbite whatever challenges. I'm getting very small card draws here. Very, very small card draws. This is probably an extremely important turn that can make or break the game. We have the one copy of Flash Freeze in our deck too, which can do a lot of put it in a lot of work. You know what? Is it is it just okay if I pass? He's not gonna not swing here. I think I just like doing this. And we can actually just block here and develop another Overosian Sentry or getting some card draw. So this is pretty good for us. The fact that we have like the cheaper unit to curve in here is massive. Nothing escapes my watch. This one cannot block either, which is huge. Which means I can drag the Sejuani. I can just kind of do this. Then drag the Sejuani towards the end. And um, 
Yeah. This another another harsh wins is pretty massive for him. Brittle Steel works too. It's gonna be hard for him to like protect the Sejuani as well as protecting his face. I think what he would do here is he would uh, harsh wins a couple like the uh, Glory Seeker and the uh, Assessor. This was a little bit unexpected. This doesn't seem to be... Does that get the job done for him? Keeps him alive at one. We lose our five cost units. He protects his Sejuani. Now we're in an awkward spot all of a sudden. How do I navigate this to best play around? I want to play around, um, what's the card called? Reckoning. To do that, I should be developing a five cost unit here. Getting Sejuani onto the field gives us the, the ability to play if you're in North as well. It also opens up some different lines here. If I can just stay wide enough on the board, we should be okay. I'm definitely playing into Reckoning here. I am no longer playing into Reckoning here. Oh, no Assessor in hand. He probably doesn't swing here. He can swing with this. This makes a lot of sense. We can just block one. Uh, it's like a lot of reasons just to open attack here. We're wide enough on the board that Fury of the North oftentimes just gets there anyway. Swing with the Sojuani last. I think it's Sejuani last, right? I think it's Sejuani last. Because, um... She won't get the Overwhelm damage, and she's the one that's not as susceptible to Brittle Steel. This should be okay. He would need to have very specific cards here to have a chance. And he's only got two cards in hand. So brittle still. At this point, I think we just we just go for the Fury of the North here for sure. And even if he has like a flash freeze, he's losing his entire board, and we are just in a crazy position. Definitely a bit of a high roll in this game, but not bad of a mulligan. Mid range decks, dude. Not my go-to strategy, but effective in that at that. You guys have a fantastic day. I'll see you next time.